All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Google Search Central SEO Office Hours Hangout. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a search advocate at Google here in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, where people can join in and ask their questions around search, and we can try to find some answers. A uh, bunch of things were already submitted on YouTube, so we can go through some of those. Uh, but if any of you want to get started with the first question, you're welcome to jump on in. Hi, John. <laughs> I, I hope it's OK if I start. Uh, I have a quick question uh, regarding Core Web Vitals. Um, does it make a difference if a Core Web Vital is uh, below the, the uh, lower threshold or is between the lower and the upper threshold? Uh, what I mean is if the uh, Core Web Vital is uh, yellow or green, does it make a difference for the ranking uh, beginning in May? Um, I don't know if we, we've announced anything specific around that. My, my understanding is uh, we, we see if it's in, in the green, and then that kind of counts as it's OK or not. Uh, so if it's in yellow, that wouldn't be kind of in the green. Um, but I, I don't know what, what the final approach there will be. Uh, because there are a number of factors that come together. And I think the, the general idea is if we can recognize that a page uh, matches all of these criteria, then we would like to use that appropriately in search for ranking. Um, I don't know what the approach would be where it's like there's some things that are OK and some things that are not perfectly OK, like where, how, how that would balance out. OK, will there be some kind of uh, information uh, before May about this? I, I suspect so, yeah. I mean, the, the general guideline is that we would like to use these criteria to also be able to show a badge in the search results, uh, which I, I think there have been some experiments happening around that. And for that, we really need to know that all of the factors are compliant. So if it's not on HTTPS, then essentially, even if the rest is OK, then that wouldn't be enough. OK, thanks. Sure. Uh, good morning, John. I had a question in regards to knowledge panels. Uh, I'm working on a client site, and I wanted to see what steps I can take to get a knowledge panel generated. Is there a certain schema, certain things I have to do uh, to make that happen? Um, we, we don't have any guidelines for how to like enable a knowledge panel. Essentially, that's something that our algorithms try to pick up algorithmically, uh, automatically. And uh, that's something where we take into account a number of different sources of information to try to figure out what, what are the entities that are associated with this page and how relevant are they, how should we be showing that in search. Uh, so it's not that there's a specific meta tag that you need to do or a specific type of structured data that you need to add. It's more that everything kind of needs to, to align so that we can really recognize this page or this site is about a specific kind of entity. OK. So no, no fantastic answer there, or no straightforward <laughs> answer there. Um, I, I know there, there's some people uh, outside of Google who have been working all around kind of the, the knowledge panel things. Yeah, Andy just uh, linked to, to Jason Bernard. Uh, he's, he's definitely totally on top of this, and he can probably give you a lot of tips on things that you can kind of work to, to make a line. OK, thank you. I think someone raised his hand. Before. Hi, John. Uh, I have two questions, if it's not a problem. And uh, the first one regards the duplicate content. Uh, say we have a page that describes a bunch of cars, right? So certain part of the description and content is the same. It is unique. We wrote it. And it's an information that users will find helpful. But how will Google look at that? Will it be some sort of negative score or something? Well, can some. OK. So with, 
with that kind of duplicate content, it's not so much that there is a negative score associated with it. It's more that if we find exactly the same information on multiple pages on the web and someone searches specifically for that piece of information, then we'll try to find the best matching page. So if you have the same content on multiple of your pages, then we won't show all of these pages. We'll try to pick one of them and show that. So it's not that there is any kind of negative signal associated with that. In, in a lot of cases, that's, that's kind of normal that you have some some amount of shared content across some of the pages. Yeah, uh, a really common uh, case, uh, for example, is with with e-commerce. If you have a product and someone else is selling the same product, uh, or within a website, maybe you have a footer that you share across all of your pages, and sometimes that's a pretty big footer. And technically, that's duplicate content, but we we can kind of deal with that. So that's that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, great. So the second question would be about uh, different languages. So we have, um, say, English and Spanish. And we have the same article, but it's translated. And we have great uh, rankings in, say, Spanish-speaking uh, area. And will that good ranking uh, uh, work for us so we get a better ranking in the US or English-speaking area? Not automatically. So we, we treat these as different pages, and uh, we, we will try to rank them individually. Um, however, what, what usually is done when you have a localized copy of your content is that you link between the localized versions. Uh, so you would link from the English version to the Spanish version, from the Spanish version to the English version. And based on these links, we would be able to distribute like some of the signals associated with that good page with that new language version that you also have. So it's it's not like there's an automatic kind of your page in English will rank just as well as your page in Spanish. Uh, but some of that effort that you put in, if you link between those versions, that will, will be associated there. Um, it's also the case that sometimes the competition in different languages is just very different. Uh, so you might have a very strong page in Spanish, and the English version is a much more competitive market, then even if we forward some of the signals to your English version, it might be very different with regards to the, the competition in the search results. OK, thank you very much. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, I have two questions about uh, video. So when we add an image to a website, we usually use alt tag, we use title tag, and caption so that Google can understand what is this image about? What can we do for video? If I upload or embed a video in my content, what can I do? Um, I, I don't know the names offhand, but for video, we do have a type of structured data that you can use. And it also has fields for things like descriptions and, and title, I think, for videos as well. So that's something you can definitely use. Um, but the, the more practical thing is kind of like with images as well. If you have a caption right next to the video, if you have a heading on that part of the page, uh, all of that kind of applies to the embedded content as well. Uh, so that's something that doesn't always require special markup or special attributes to use. Uh, second question is, uh, is there any difference uh, uploading a video or embedding a video from a SEO point of view. Like if I embed a video, it means I am uh, pulling the video from other website. When you, but when I upload it, it means it is on my website. It means it is my content. So does Google differentiate in this way, or it's always the same from a SEO point of view? It's essentially the same. Like it's it's very common that you have a separate CDN for videos, for example, and technically that's kind of a separate website. And from our point of view, if if that works for your users, if your content is accessible properly for Google for indexing, then that's perfectly fine. Thank you. Cool. A bunch of people also have their hands raised. John, just wanted to follow up a bit on that duplicate content question. Um, uh, obviously, what you said is uh, perfectly accurate. But I, I think there are some cases where 
uh, Google doesn't automatically merge two pages together for various reasons, doesn't have enough signals or signals are conflicting. So in that case, both pages might actually compete among um, um, one against each other. And in that case, it kind of, while there's no specific penalty or uh, any uh, algorithmic uh, factor to kind of pull the site down, you're still uh, at a disadvantage because you're trying to compete for the same thing with two pages. So I guess sure. that uh, it's it's still worth to try to make sure to set up signals so they do actually canonicalize properly without hoping that Google kind of uh, picks that up automatically. Yeah, definitely, yeah. John, can I just clarify that, that video question? Sure. I, I thought, unless I'm, my knowledge is a couple of years out of date, that if you used YouTube as your kind of host for the videos and you did a Google a, a video search of things, then YouTube would be the, the source and not your page. Whereas if you use Vimeo or something else, then actually your page shows as the source. Is that not still the case? It depends. Ah, excellent. It depends, the, the standard answer. Uh, sorry. Uh, but I, I mean, with, with YouTube, you essentially have two video landing pages. You have the landing page on, on YouTube, and you have the landing page on your site. And we, we kind of have to figure out which one of these pages to show. And it can happen that we show your site as the, the video result landing page just because we have more information there, perhaps. Uh, it can also be that we show the, the YouTube landing page because maybe we have more signals or more information there. Uh, so that's something where it's not automatically the case that we would show the YouTube landing page. And uh, some, some other video platforms also have their own landing pages that they create automatically. Some video hosting platforms don't do that at all. Um, essentially, that's, that's kind of up to you there. And so you Essentially, by if you do it on something like Vimeo, which doesn't have a public facing, all the difference is you're not creating a competing video when yeah. you create when you upload it. Whereas with YouTube, if it's public, you're creating your own and the competing YouTube version, and therefore, yeah, you're competing with YouTube. Right. Yeah. I, I guess that's one thing that could play in, into that. <laughs> uh, it's also, I mean, pe people sometimes search for videos on YouTube. So if you want I, to be visible that. there, uh. that, that might be kind of something you'd want to do anyway. But yeah, it is it is something where you, you kind of need to think about that a little bit as well. And it's not like 100% the same if you have uh, the, the same video file that you're hosting yourself or that someone else is hosting for you without a landing page, or like you essentially have two video landing pages. Uh, sometimes you also want to have two video landing pages because it's like there's slightly different content or it attracts slightly different audience. OK. Hi, hi John. Uh, can I ask something? Sure. sure. OK. Uh, so. For example, uh, there is a website that is getting a good amount of search traffic. Now, um, I just wanted to know if that same website is getting traffic from some other channels, like direct traffic, social traffic, or some traffic from other blogs. So that non-search related traffic that a website is getting is, is some kind of positive signal for Google, like, uh, like Google finds that this website is getting a lot of traffic from uh, direct or social channels. So we should push uh, this website in search also so that search users can find it uh, easily. We, we don't use that for SEO. So if, like, I, I think it's great to, as from, from a website point of view, to diversify the different sources of traffic uh, so that you have different places where, where people can find your site, different places how people can get to your site. Uh, but we don't use that for search. Um, so if, if you're active, I don't know, on Facebook or on other social media channels and you get a lot of traffic there, then that's, that's kind of a way to balance out some of the uncertainty maybe around uh, search or around Discover or around some of the other channels that you also use. 
sorry. So kind of, I, I think that diversification makes sense. It's something to, to work on, and it helps to make it a little bit safer with regards to your presence online. Uh, but it's not something that we take into account for search. Not directly or indirect. Like, for example, a brand is, uh, suddenly starts getting a lot of direct traffic. So there's no impact on its search performance. No, anyway. no. I mean, indirectly, you might see something if people go to your site and they think it's fantastic and they share it with other people and we pick that up as a link, then maybe we could take that into account, but not directly. Sure. Sure. Thank you. OK, I, I see a bunch of people raise their hands, and I just found a place where I can see the names. So um, I, I'll just go through from, from the top uh, of my list here. Uh, Benjamin. Hi, John. How are you? Uh, Hi. Really long time listener, first time caller. It's an honor to be here. I remember the Matt Cuts days, but um, thank you for letting me in. Um, I'm writing in, or I'm calling in because I purchased a website that has been around since 1998. It was owned by the same person till 2018. And can I paste it in the, the am I allowed to paste it in the chat? Sure. OK. Um, it got purchased. And then from what I can tell from all my SEO research, it got possibly turned into a PBN, potentially, or just a really bad website. I purchased it. and. I've done everything I can to turn it around. I got in touch with the original owner, stalked the internet, found him, been emailing him back and forth, asked him why he sold it. He just said he got too old for it. Um, updating all the content, added new UI, added social profiles, which didn't exist. I'm seeing slight movements in traffic, which leads me to my question. I'm investing a lot of time into this, you know, money too, but it's just really my time. And I'm putting my heart and soul into it because I do think that this site needs to exist. I haven't found much on this topic. Am I wasting my time? Like, does Google say, oh, this was a, maybe a potentially a PBN or they did spam me back? Oh, I did disavow as well. Um, am I wasting my time? Like, can you talk to the point of like, are sites able to be turned around, especially under new ownership, new who is information, new domain, new host as well? Yeah, um, I, I think the short answer is yes, you can turn it around. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in general, the, the most common issue that we find is that maybe there's a manual action involved. And that's something you would see in Search Console. And yeah. I, assume, yeah, I assume you check. Yeah. Uh, and if there's no manual action, then essentially it's kind of a, a normal website. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not that we would take into account any, any previous manual actions, like if, if some owner in between had a manual action, that's not something that we would take into account. So essentially, the way, the way the site is now is the way that our algorithms are looking at it at the moment. Mm -hmm. And if you work to improve the site, and if there are other issues associated with the site that you work to improve, then that should improve mm -hmm. over time. There's no black stamp on it forever type of thing. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, thanks, John. All right, John. Andrew. Let, let me just run through the names as I have them in the list. And then after that, I'll, I'll try to get through some of the submitted ones as well. But just to kind of make sure that we follow like who all is in the list. Yes, John. Hello. Thank you. Uh, well, Hi. my question is about the situation when a site has an app uh, connected uh, for this, to the site and uh, for mobile users uh, browsers, browsers offer them to download uh, the application so uh, showing some kind of banners from google play or app store uh, this offer uh, as you uh, may know appear at the top of the site and inevitably it creates layout shifting and it's also hard to, to fix this uh, shifting and i wanted to ask uh, what is your opinion on this matter is google okay with uh, these situations um, I, I, I assume you're specifically asking about the cumulative layout shift from the oh, core right. website. Sure, sure. Yeah. 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 So for that, I, I would focus on the metrics that you can pick up from the testing tools and from the real user data that you can pick up for the site. Uh, so it's, it's something where we don't explicitly say this specific kind of pop-up or banner is OK, or this specific banner is not OK. It's really just 
you, you can test it and see what number comes out. And maybe there are things that you can do to improve that so that the number looks better. And where you can also look at the number and say, this is OK for me, or this is something I need to improve. Uh, well, but uh, they do create uh, this uh, shifting, and uh, well, I don't know. It's uh, not uh, you can't control them because it's not on your side. I mean, uh, as I understand, uh, it's not uh, well. It's uh, browsers; uh, they just offer those banners. I I, I can like uh, um, I don't know, just close them. I mean, for for forever, but uh, well, yeah, it's not an option uh, as well, a good option. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how exactly that that looks okay. Uh, okay. on a browser, so it's it's hard to say. But it's it's something where if you see that this is a problem for some of your pages, maybe there are ways that you can do to make it less visible on the important pages and maybe limit it to other pages. Or do something such as allow the user to to click on a button and then trigger this uh, in the browser, so something along those lines. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, Lee, I don't know if you asked before or already, or still waiting. Oh. Hey, John. Um, real quick, just just two quick questions here. Um, piggybacking on the question about page speed earlier in Core Web Vitals. Um, I work with a, a company, and they have a very authoritative page. We're more authoritative than our competitors that are outranking us for a number of keywords, and that has to do with some other factors that I'm dealing with right now. But um, we do have a slower page significantly. However, I would, and I, I would say, objectively, we have a more valuable experience. We offer a better product that sort of thing, and we get more traffic than these other uh, pages that we're ranking against. So my question is, is page speed used now as a, a significant ranking factor that would outweigh the content that we're providing and the user experience and that sort of thing? And will that get to be uh, more of a factor come May and, and that sort of thing when Core Web Vitals rolls out? Uh, we use speed on, on mobile at the moment. Uh, okay. So that's something that kind of plays in a little bit there. And uh, in May, I, I think the, the idea is to kind of revamp how we look at that. And maybe, I don't know, my, my guess is that we will in, use that a little bit stronger as a signal. However, it's still the case that when we can recognize that someone is looking for something specific or a page is particularly relevant uh, to users, then that's, that's what we plan to show. Uh, so for example, if someone is looking for your company, we wouldn't show some other page just because it's a little bit faster. And that kind of means that if you have a really strong page in, in your topic area, then probably that, that will be OK, even if it's a little bit slower. But yeah. Yeah. It's, right. it's really hard to kind of say, like, this is where the line will be drawn, and this much is like not strong enough or anything like that. Cool. That makes sense. We're working on a number of things, so I'm not super worried about it. But it is one of those things where you know, our, our engineering team is sort of backed up and working on getting these. We have a very large website, so um, that's obviously one of the things that we're working on. Um, my second question is about um, just subdomains. So. Um, my company is a blog that operates on a, a secondary subdomain as opposed to a subfolder. Um, and I'm just wondering, as far as ranking signals and stuff from Google, um, is that viewed as another domain entirely? Or do we have authority that's going back and forth between the two? Obviously, we're linking between the two effectively and stuff. It depends. Uh, so in, in a some cases, we will see this as part of the main site. In some cases, we'll see it as something kind of separate. Um, so for, for the most part, I, I wouldn't recommend just changing this just blindly and hoping that you'll get like a big, big advantage out of it. Uh, but rather, if you're thinking about consolidating things on one domain, if it makes more sense from kind of an infrastructure or tracking point of view, then I think all of that, those things kind of 
point more in the direction of using subdirectories. Uh, but sometimes it's also the same that kind of applies to subdomains, where you say infrastructure-wise, it's easier like this. Maybe you're using some CMS that needs to be on a separate subdomain, uh, all of those things. So hard Got to it. say. All right. Thanks so much, John. Sure. Antonio. Hi. Uh, it's an honor to ask you directly. Thank you so much. Question. Uh, I have a page that's ranked for dozens of words in the top positions. Uh, and for a search or a group of search, I'm ranked for the second page of the results. Uh, the best thing to do is to include uh, these terms and talk about it on the same page or create a specific page for those terms and link to do it. Uh, I have a, a good and bad uh, experience with both options. And uh, that makes I'm really doubtful. Uh, what's your recommendation? Uh, if you want, uh, I can do an example for uh, explain better my question. Yeah, I, 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 I totally understand the question. And I don't think I can give you an absolute answer. Uh, because li like you said, sometimes it makes sense to separate things out on multiple pages. Sometimes it makes sense to concentrate on, on a single page. I think it depends a lot on uh, the, the user expectations, maybe also the competition uh, with regards to, like, would, would users be confused if they went to one general page and they expect a kind of a specific page? Um, or would users also be OK with a general page that is ranking? For the most part, I think fewer pages make sense because you can make stronger pages. Uh, they're a little bit stronger with regards to kind of the competition. Uh, but at, on the, at the same time, if you're specific about a certain topic, then that's a very well-targeted page. Uh, so finding that balance, I think, is really hard. Uh, my, my usual recommendation is for you to try it out and test it out and see what, what works well for you uh, in, in your specific situation. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. I, I mean, it's not, not like a perfect answer, but I, I hopefully <laughs> give yeah, you some I, ideas. At least there's I, no absolute answer. I, I know I have this problem uh, um, many years, and uh, I will not um, know exactly to do because it's Google. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. You are, you are incredible. Thank you. Stefan. Good Nobin. Um, so I, let me set the stage real quick. I, I work for a, a fairly large company, um, and I have similar uh, subdomain duplicate content challenges as Lee does. Um, it's not exact duplicate content because the context is slightly different. There's a purchase aspect on one subdomain and a stream aspect on, on a different one. Um, so we've been. Uh, trying to tackle some indexation issues where one subdomain actually has uh, uh, a lower traffic potential. We rank typically less well and so forth. So as, as I'm looking through GSC, um, one of my uh, site maps, <clears throat> um, looking through the excluded uh, uh, selection. And so for one of the details, the duplicate submitted URL uh, not selected as canonical. There's a huge number of URLs uh, with that flag. And so as I started to look into some of the examples and then use the inspect uh, URL, um, I noticed that almost invariably there was no URL included in the uh, Google selected canonical. So I submitted a, a help article on, on the community and I got kind of a boilerplate answer. And I was looking as I was listening to, as we started the call, and it looks like that issue is fixed. So invariably, or it seems like the the URLs are now populated, but most of the examples that I've found are completely off base. Um, so they'll uh, they have nothing to do with the actual query that the page should rank for. So um, so my question is, uh, I guess the first question is, uh, how should one interpret uh, the Google selected canonical NA as a value? Um, I don't know. I, 
I think I saw something similar uh, on, on Twitter recently, and I think that was a bug on our side. Uh, so in particular, if we index a page, then we always have a canonical. And if the, the tool says there is no canonical available but it's indexed, then that would be kind of something conflicting on our side, not necessarily something actionable on your side. On the other hand, if it's not indexed, then it would be kind of normal that we say, well, we, we don't have a canonical associated with this URL, so it's because it's not indexed, essentially. Yeah, well, the, the report I'm looking at would be index pages only, right? Um, or at least I've confirmed that they're indexed. OK. Uh, uh, since we can uh, we configure GSC for separate subdomains, my, my hypothesis was that the alternative subdomain was actually ranking. And you would just simply not include that URL because it's not on the same subdomain as configured GSC. No, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't know what, what the specific bug there, there is. But uh, it, it should be the case that even if it's on a different domain, if we say like a different URL on another domain is canonical for this one that you have, uh, that we should show that. Uh, so it shouldn't be the case that we we would just say, oh, we don't know, but actually we do know, but we just not, don't want to tell you about it. Uh, so that seems more like like a bug on our side rather than a sign that like we we use a different subdomain for that. Okay. Um, well, it looks as though the bug may have been fixed, but you may have introduced a, a new bug. <laughs> oh no. Okay. The canonicals seem completely off base from the topic that um, should be. Canonicalized. <laughs> OK. Um, if you can drop some examples maybe in the chat here, I can pick that up afterwards and pass that on to the team. Can do. Thank you much. Sure. Thanks. Angie, I think you also have your hand raised. Hi, John. Um, Hi. As always, thank you for doing this. Um, so I'm doing a site move for a client, um, and I had a few questions about that. So we're changing the domain name. So they, they want to kind of present the brand um, as more modern. So just changing it to the acronym of the full name. Um, and we're not removing any pages, changing any content on pages or anything like that. So uh, it's going to just be doing the redirects um, and then using the move up, the change of address tool in Search Console and et cetera. So pretty straightforward. But um, I was wondering if everything should be redirected. So like the sitemap and robots.txt for uh, specifically. Um, like, is it recommended to leave both the old sitemap up and the new sitemap up so that Google is able to find all the uh, redirects to the new site? Yes? OK. And then for the robots, um, I saw that there was, in the crawl stats support document, I believe, there was. Um, uh, it said it said that like 200s and 400s were successful robot responses, and 429s and 500s were unsuccessful. Did not mention anything about redirects. So, is it recommended to you know leave that not redirected so that Google is still able to crawl from the old site? Or um, I I don't think it matters with regards to the redirect. Uh, I I think in our site move documentation at some point we had a recommendation that you have an empty robots text file on the old domain just so that we can crawl all URLs and then find the redirect to a new one and recognize oh it's it's now blocked or it's a 404 or whatever. Um, my my guess is that's more of kind of like super small optimization with regards to crawling and not really necessary. So in particular, sitemap file and robots text files, they're they're files that are more like control files and not indexed anyway. So if they do or do not redirect, is it it doesn't really matter. Uh, with regards to all of the indexable content, that is something that is is kind of important for us in the sense that if we can recognize that a site is only partially moving, then we'll kind of have to shift into a mode of like, oh, we have to figure out what actually changed here. Uh, whereas if we can recognize a site has completely moved, all of the indexable content has moved, then we can shift into the mode of like, oh, we'll just transfer all of the signals uh, in bulk to the new domain. OK, yeah. So we are doing um, like a one-time switch, so we're not moving in sections. So it'll just literally be like flipping the switch, um, and I guess the signals will be start uh, will start processing will be processed right away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, ideally. Yeah. 
Okay. And then actually on the uh, note of like site signals, because I know that um, these days it's, you know, we talk about how pages are being ranked rather than domains as a whole, but how much of a factor are the site signals? Um, like what I'm trying to ask is basically say everything, say we do everything, you know, perfectly. Um, we're not changing anything on the site either. So everything should be pretty much the same. Um, once Google's finished reprocessing everything, um, can we expect to have essentially the same sort of performance and everything as, as we had before? It's going to be on the same server as well. So the only thing that's changing is essentially just a domain name. Um, or, you know, what about new pages that go up on the site after the, the change? Um, because it's a new domain that has had no previous history, could new pages be a little bit at a disadvantage because Google has less site signals or um, I guess basically how much site, how much of the site signals have to do with that? I, I think in, in an ideal situation, all of that will just transfer and it'll just continue working just like before. Uh, so we, we've been doing a number of analysis internally on site moves in particular just to make sure that like we're, we're not missing anything, that nothing kind of goes wrong with, with most of the site moves. And for the most part, we, we can see that it clearly just completely transfers to a new domain. Uh, so if, if there's nothing kind of weird associated with a new domain and the, the website really does a clean move, then that should be completely fine. I think it's, it's always something where you don't completely know what to expect, because it's it's a different domain. You can't really try it out ahead of time. So it's always a little bit of uncertainty involved. Um, so my recommendation there is just to make sure that you're really tracking all of the details, that you have a big spreadsheet with all of the, the checklist items to, to double check, so that should anything weird happen, you can kind of be certain that we have all of these basics covered, and it's really I don't know, some, something kind of obscure that you couldn't have known ahead of time. Or otherwise, you can go through the list and see, oh, I forgot to set the hreflang, or I forgot this specific thing. And uh, then you can explicitly go in and fix that. OK, perfect. Um, and then I, my last question was, um, so in the site move documentation, it, it does mention that uh, we should expect rankings to fluctuate. Um, and I was just uh, kind of thinking about like the process of how um, Google would reprocess those pages and how that would actually affect the ranking. So for example, like, is it more, uh, you know, if I have a page that on the, on the old site that's currently ranking for position one on a certain keyword, um, if we do the re when we do the redirect, when Google discovers it, is there a period before, um, I guess the crawling and sort of re-indexing happens where it would actually drop out of the search results, um, before, being replaced by the new page if everything is good, or is it if it crawls it and reprocesses it immediately? Um, the, or the, sorry, or does the old page just stay there until the new page is kind of reprocessed? Yeah. Um, so essentially, what happens there is we switch to canonical. Uh, so we would have the old page index. We would start seeing the redirect. We would follow the redirect. Uh, see that the same content is there, and then our systems would say, oh, it looks like it moved to this new URL, and we would just switch that over. It's not the case that it's like it would fall out first and then be re-indexed again. It's really kind of like, oh, we see this connection. We see both of these pages. We can just switch it over to the new one. So it okay. shouldn't be the case that there is like a hole with regards to traffic. But usually with, with all site moves, you have this period of, there's some things associated with the old site, some things associated with the new site, and it takes a little bit of time to shift the majority of things over. Um, in a lot of the site moves that I looked at for, for double checking, this is, I don't know, a period of a couple of days, maybe a week or so, where it just kind of like fluctuates a little bit until it settles down again in the, kind of a similar state with the new domain. OK. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, we, we have tons of stuff submitted as well, but it seems like, I don't know, with the, the hands and, and such, uh, it seems to be working fairly well. So I'm going to focus on questions from here and maybe add some comments to the questions that were submitted uh, so that those don't completely get lost. 
All right. Uh, I think uh, Kadu, if I get your name right. Yeah, yeah it's right. Thank you, John, uh, for this opportunity. Um, I, my question is more about uh, Web Vitals. Uh, because we, we have an education platform, and many of our requests are made from logged in users. And basically, we treat logged users different from all logged users. Um, the same page, we, lo we load a bit more stuff on a little more stuff for logged users. And this makes the page much more deficient on Web Vitals. And my question is, uh, how concerned I have to be about my logged users in this page with, that we serve for them? Um, if, if you have the same URL that is publicly accessible as well, then it is very likely that we can include that in kind of the aggregate data for Core Web Vitals, kind of in, in the real user metrics. Uh, side of things, and then we might be counting that in as well. So if the logged in page exists in a public forum, then we might think some users are seeing this longer page, perhaps, or kind of more complicated page, and we would count those metrics. Whereas if you had separate URLs and we wouldn't be able to actually index those separate URLs, then that seems like something that we would be able to separate out. I don't know what, what the exact guidance here is from, from the Core Web Vitals side, though. So um, I, I would double check specifically with regards to Chrome in the uh, Crux uh, help pages to, to see like, how, how that would play a role in your specific case. Thank you, John. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Darcy. John, how's it going? Wonderful. Good. Pretty good. How about um, you? Okay, so I have a question kind of along the lines of some of the subdomain questions that people have been asking. Um, so, um, so if because uh, you kind of said like, I, th I think if I heard your answer correctly, there might there is some times when that can make sense. Um, so I'm wondering if this situation makes sense and what are the potential risks involved here, where. Um, the the site is going to exist in, in two parts. One is like a, the content focused part of the site, and then the other is the e commerce focused part of the site. And so you would have you know shop and then your e commerce side on, on the subdomain. Um, would you recommend a couple of questions? Would you recommend that strategy? What are the risks involved? And then how much GameStop stock do you own? <laughs> Oh man, yeah, I, I don't know about the last one. <laughs> like, that's so weird. Such a weird situation. Uh, throws me off completely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I think to to kind of back up uh, a bit, uh, we we regularly talk with the search leads about subdomains versus subdirectories, and tell them like, oh, SEOs are so obsessed about subdirectories and. Such and they always tell us like they should just use whatever makes sense. Like our system should be able to deal with subdomains and subdirectories essentially in the same way. Uh, so I I think there's some more second order effects that some people are seeing there, but I don't think it's something where I'd say like you will automatically have a bonus if you go to subdirectories or if you go to subdomains kind of thing. So if you have your shop on a separate subdomain and that's what works well for you with regards to tracking and all of that, then I, I would try to keep that. I, I don't see a problem with moving that over or trying to find a way to do like a reverse proxy and move that to a subdirectory. So you, you think you think they can because I mean I guess always the the concern right is the two separate site situation and and trying to rank because you want both to rank et cetera yeah. you know the the problem that we have here is a technology problem and where the customer wants to um, use Shopify for the e-commerce side but not for the content side right and then Shopify can't install on a subfolder um, so uh, you you. You feel that it still could work just fine. Uh, yeah. Would would Google yeah. decide to link those and, and consider them one site, or are they always going to be considered two sites? Uh, no matter no matter what. 
It, it depends a little bit. I, I think in a situation where you just have two subdomains, then probably we would treat those as separate sites. Uh, if you have a lot of different subdomains, then we might see, like, oh, like they're using wildcard subdomains as categories, for example. Then that would be a clear sign that actually this is one site. We should treat that as one thing. Uh, I think in a case where you have content on one side, one subdomain, and the shop on the other, I, I really don't see a problem also with like competing against each other because usually people come with one intent. And if they want the product, they'll find the product pages. If they want information, they'll find the informational pages. It's not that these are competing against each other or otherwise kind of like annoying each other in search. OK. Cool. Thank you. What was the other question? That was the GameStop stuff. It was that a was joke. It. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Whew. All right. Thanks. Eric, thanks. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hello. Uh, hey, thanks for having me, and thanks for doing these sessions. It's, it's great. It's, it's really good. Uh, I have a few, few questions regarding search. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, uh, we, we, had an, uh, we had a review of, of iPhone that came out, and uh, for, for some reason, it ranked lower than our first impressions article that we did that covered uh, reviews from other magazines uh, all over the world. But you know, we are uh, re really, really strong locally uh, in, in our country, and we had a review like really, really good review, and it was it was uh, below our article that covered the first impressions. Uh, after like one or two months, we we noticed that we were missing the review uh, schema. Uh, with the rating and and stuff and the price, uh, so we added that. Uh, so we this. Uh, so we added this to the to the article, and uh, and then after a couple hours, it ranked uh, above the first impressions article that we did before. Is that possible? I I don't think that would be directly related. So in particular, the the rich results or the the structured data is something that we use for the rich results in the search results. It's not something we would use as a ranking factor itself. Uh, what might have happened is that you changed the page enough that our system said, oh, we need to reconsider how we kind of index this page. And then based on that, we kind of reconsidered the ranking. But uh, that's, that shouldn't be related to adding structured data to a page. Uh, okay. Essentially, so it's not the case that every review needs to have review structured data on it. Yes, that's, that, that, that's what I thought. Okay, so uh, and uh, also with this, uh, do the missing fields, uh, you know, in schema org, uh, the in the review type, do the missing fields like brand, SKU, uh, description, aggregate rating, and ISBN. Uh, do these matter if, if they're missing? Uh, because uh, I see that the Google only requires the, the three, the price, the name of the pro product, and uh, the third one I forgot, uh, the rating. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you have the requirements covered, then we would show that in the rich results. And the rest are really more optional. It's not, at least as far as I know, it's not the case that we would rank things more if you have more of the fields filled out. Okay. Okay. And do that. that does, does Google? Uh, I know that you uh, and search results that Google only uses uh, like you know algorithms that that find content on the site. But uh, do the uh, meta tag, meta tags, description, and keywords matter at all for results? Um, we we don't use the keywords meta tag at all. So that. Like you can do whatever you want with it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think any search engine uses that anymore. Uh, the description we use as, as a guide for the description or the snippet that we show in search. It's not always purely from the description meta tag, but for, for a lot of cases, it is, it is something that we use there. Uh, so if you have a specific snippet that you want to have shown, then definitely make sure that's in the description. Uh, but we wouldn't use that as a ranking factor. It's more that. You're showing users what this page is about, and maybe they will click through more if they understand it a little bit better. But it's not that it would rank higher because of that. Yeah, I see all right. Uh, and we received an email uh, actually yesterday and today for our, our web page uh, for Search Console that uh, you like, launched a, a new service or something that uh, grouped all the subdomains and subdirectories and HTTP and HTTPS into one domain. And uh, so we you know, verified the domain and everything. And uh, we still don't see the data that we see for our HTTPS www site. Will this show up eventually? Yes. Yes. Um, the, 
the data sometimes takes up to a week to be completely visible in Search Console. So some features are a little bit faster. Some features take a little bit more time. Uh, but that's kind of normal that it takes a, a little bit of time to be visible. And uh, I think with this message in particular, we sent it out when we noticed that sites are not completely verified in Search Console, uh, that maybe you have traffic to the HTTPS version and you have HTTP verified. Uh, that's something we, we just wanted to make sure that people are, are aware that they're not looking at the full picture. Uh, so with the domain verification, that's all kind of covered automatically. I see. Perfect. And we also noticed uh, that our sitemaps were not indexing properly or you know, loading properly in Search Console. And it, it was fine for, for a few years. I mean, you know, no problems. But uh, like last week, we noticed that for some reason, uh, the Search Console couldn't load our uh, sitemaps from the sitemap index. We have an index file you know, that with, uh, with all the sitemaps, the parts. And it loaded uh, most of them. But the ones that matter the most, the posts, they just couldn't load it. So is okay. that something we can like, you know, do something about? And um, I, I would probably post about that in the help forum with the okay. specific sitemap URL so that someone can take a look there. And if, if it is something that's more on Google's side, then usually the folks in the help forum can help to escalate that to us. I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a bug, because we added some, some parameters into the, into the URL, and it loaded fine. So it shouldn't be, you know, uh, should yeah. be better, yeah. obviously. OK, and then last question. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah. Then we had a review for AirPods Max. <coughs> we were the first in the country to have this, both the product and the review. And I just don't know why we, we, we still don't show up in the results. And it's like really annoying, you know, because we spend you know, a lot of time and, and effort into the for the review, and we don't show up in the results. So can I don't know. It? Can you sort it out? Yeah, I I don't know. I can't make you rank automatically higher. Of course. Uh, yeah. So the the one thing I would watch out for is if if the page is indexed or not. If it's not indexed, then usually that's more of a technical thing that you can work to improve. But if it is indexed and it's just not ranking the way that you want. Um, it's it's really hard for us to kind of like say this is a big problem or not a big problem. So what what I would also do there is maybe post in the help forum mm -hmm. and uh, kind of the specifics of the URL that you're using, uh, the queries that you're looking at, especially if you're looking at a specific country, maybe those details as well, mm -hmm. and they they can take a look at that there and escalate that to us if if appropriate. That's but right. uh, a lot of these ranking questions are really tricky because it's it's often like which which page should we show? It's like everyone wants to be first. Of course. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, and and uh, have, a, have a good day, all of you. Thanks. All right, uh, Mark. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, John. Um, this is more like a like a European focus question. Um, we have um, a cookie content layer. Obviously, it's IAB conform, uh, sending out the correct strings and everything. So my first question was. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Google mentioned that uh, loading layers like these will be recognized, and they will not be added to the page speed index. However, when I do check um, the domain and the page speed index uh, inside tool, uh, it is recognized, and if it's um, uh, meant or it's found to be improvable. However, we use probably the fastest uh, CMP on the market, so there's really nothing to improve here. Um, just a question: Will Will Google go back and take that out of consideration, um, also with reference to May, or what do you think? Um, essentially, we'd be able to take that out with regards to indexing the content. But from a speed point of view, we would not differentiate uh, between kind of like this kind of banner or any other kind of banner. So essentially, from from a speed point of view, it is something we would see as something that users would see uh, when they go to the page, and uh, that would be taken into account there. So I don't think, at least as far as I know, that we would have any logic to say, oh, this is a proper cookie banner. Therefore, we will ignore that it's slow or that it uh, causes layout shifts. Uh, well, there's, there's that uh, list available on uh, officially registered uh, CMPs, right? So we're doing something that's legally legally obliged, and um, yeah, we're just wondering because in theory, 
uh, a competitor who is not using any of those uh, uh, layers might have a, a page speed advantage. And when page speed is com becoming more and more uh, important, this is just um, you know more like out of curiosity how you deal with that. Yeah, my my understanding is we would see that as a part of a page. So that would be something if it's slowing down the the loading of your page, then that would be something we would take into account and say this page is slower than maybe the same page without uh, that specific setup. Um, but I I think the another aspect that kind of plays into that as well is that you're competing with sites that have similar setups. Uh, so it's less a matter of like we will not show your site at all in search. Uh, but essentially, other people have the same kind of struggles and need to figure out the same kind of thing. So it's kind of like you're competing with other sites that have the same problem. So it makes it a little bit more even. Uh, but obviously, in the situation that you mentioned, where if someone is, let's say, I don't know, let's call it rogue and doesn't do any kind of banner at all, then that would be something that we would say, well, maybe this is a faster page. but. Maybe the other page is a little bit slower, but it's a better page or better fitting page for the user. And then we would still rank that there. So it, it's something where we, we do take speed and usability into account for rankings, but it's not the only thing. It's like the content is still, by far, I think, the, the biggest aspect there. OK, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Raymond, let's see. Uh, hi, John. Um, so I also posted this question to the comments um, for the video. Um, we have a site with a mega menu that has over 1,000 links. Um, it used to be that this mega menu back in 2018 would only load upon user action. So they would, they, you know, when the user hovered above the, uh, the nav bar, uh, as Najax called it, load those links. At some point in 2018, we added those static links and. And you know, again, I know correlation isn't causation, but around that same time, we saw a, a, a big drop in our, in our search traffic. Uh, now we are now contemplating removing these links uh, from our nav bar as static links and going back to links that only load upon user action with an AJAX call. We are nevertheless retaining a clear path to all of these links on relevant pages. So we'll still have a clear crawl path to those links, but only on relevant pages rather than having these links on every page, you know, um, you know, um, thousands of mega menu links on every page. So we're wondering what would possibly, what could possibly be the impact or ramifications of removing these 1,000 mega menu links of static links, even though we are still retaining a, a crawl path to all of these links on relevant pages. Yeah, I, I think on the one hand it's kind of hard to say because I don't know how. How the rest of your site is structured. So, if, for example, these 1,000 pages are all of your pages, uh, then it, it would be very different compared to, say, these 1,000 pages are your categories and you have a million kind of subcategories or something like that. Um, but in, in general, what, what you're looking at uh, from a change point of view is going from a more of a flat site structure to a more, um, I don't know, deeper site structure. I don't know what the official name is. Uh, I guess it's determined silo very obvious. Yeah. Um, and that's something where so sometimes I can definitely make sense. So it's it's something we, we sometimes see um, folks kind of obsessing about limiting the crawl depth, for example, and trying to make it so that uh, Googlebot can crawl to all pages in a very quick time. And to some extent, I think that makes sense. Uh, on the other hand, kind of more the top-down approach or pyramid structure um, helps us a lot more to understand the context of individual pages within the, the site. Uh, so in particular, if we know this category is associated with these other subcategories, then that's a clear connection that we have between those parts. And that definitely helps us to understand like, how these things are connected, how they work together a little bit better. Whereas if it's very flat, then we think, oh, all of these are equally important. And we don't really know which of these are connected to each other. Uh, so from, from my point of view, I think for a lot of sites, it makes sense to have more of a pyramid structure. Uh, 
Uh, but at the same time, you don't want it to be such that it's like you have to click through a million times to actually get to the actual content. You need to have, I don't know, some, some reasonable uh, number of clicks, essentially, to, to get to the content. I see. And we are, we, now, we are trying to kind of, we are an e-commerce site, so there is a, it's a case to be made for having mega menus. However, we just want to, that not to show up as static links that would get crawled. But you know, still make it available to be used as, through a user action, or a user induced action, rather than just having them there as static links. But we still are we're all looking to have a siloed site with a more kind of a pyramidal, pyramidal structure, uh, rather than something that has where we have indiscriminately have a thousand links on, on every page. Um, you know, um, so yeah, we we we're, you know we've been. We've talked to a number of SEO firms, and they told us, well, you know, if you do this, then it can greatly negatively impact your site. Because all of a sudden, these thousand weeks that you had all all these pages are, are gone, and it's not really true because we are planning to retain those links, but only on relevant pages. Uh, but yet, then and yet, and yet we're, we're being told, don't do it because if you if you lose all these one thousand links to all your pages, it's bound to have a negative effect. And I'm wondering if, if, if an empirical statement like that could be made. I, I don't think it would always have a negative effect. I, I do think if you make it too deep, then that makes it harder for us to crawl and harder for us to pass the signals around. Uh, but uh, it's not the case that like a super flat structure is going to be better than a, a kind of reasonable pyramid structure. So I personally, I would try to aim for more of a pyramid structure just to make it so that it's easier for us to understand the context of the individual pages and to forward the signals into kind of related areas easier. Um, but it's also something which is, a, is it's a very significant change on a site like that. Uh, so it's something where I understand that it makes sense to kind of get more input uh, on, on the options, maybe even to test things out. Like you take one category and say, I'll try it here and see what happens. Uh, with regards to crawling, with regards to indexing, with regards to ranking, um, all of these things. Because it's, it is quite a big step when you change your site from kind of like a super flat layout to more of a pyramid layout. Uh, cool. Thank you. Um, let me pause the recording here, maybe for a moment. I'll be here for a little bit longer so we can still answer some of the questions that are remaining. Um, but uh, if you're watching this recording, thanks, thanks for watching along. Uh, I hope you found this useful. And I'll be setting up the next batch of Hangouts probably on Monday or so, so for next week and the week after that. All right. Thanks a lot. And let me just pause.